Okay, uh, hi guys. I think we can get started with today's workshop. Um, just before I begin, if you can just let me know if you can see me okay, and also if you can hear me okay, just uh, if you could just enter that in the chat, that would be great. And um, we can go ahead and, and, and get started. I know there's going to be a couple more people uh, joining throughout. Um, so yeah, really nice to talk to everyone today. Uh, my name is Martin McDonough. I'm Lead Solutions Architect here at Smarter. I'm based out of Melbourne. So really nice to speak to everyone today. Um, the workshop that we're going to be focusing on is collaboration across the API lifecycle, designing API workflows at that scale. So I'm just going to run through a couple of slides, and then we'll jump into a bit of a working stream um, where you can go ahead and ask questions throughout. Please ask your questions in the chat or the Q&A, and I'll be monitoring my other screen just to make sure that I can address any questions that you may have. So a bit about uh, SmartPair. Um, who I work for, um, based out of Melbourne. We have global offices across the world. Um, you can probably tell by my accent, uh, it's Irish. So I'm originally from Ireland, um, where I worked with uh, SmartBear in Ireland, in the west of Ireland, a really nice small place called Galway. Um, we work with three open source initiatives. You may have heard of them in the API world, including SOAP UI, uh, for API functional testing, and then also Swagger, uh, now known as OpenAPI uh, specification. So we support these particular um, open source initiatives from the API side. We also support uh, Cucumber. So if you're um, familiar with the UI testing framework uh, for behavior-driven development, uh, we also support the Cucumber solution as well. So in terms of the API development lifecycle and kind of what we'll talk about today um, is aligned with some of the SmartPair solutions that you can see here on screen. So this is across the areas of um, ideate, create, release, and operate in terms of designing an API from a design first perspective, uh, going into testing and documentation, uh, configuration and, and publish in terms of our testing, and then also into the monitoring phase where we're either in a pre or post production environment where we want to focus on that monitoring. If it's 24 by seven, if we're looking at availability, if we're looking at uptime, and also if we're looking at functional correctness. So when we're talking about the flow of the API development lifecycle in terms of where we sit, uh, really we're focusing on collaboration and reusability. We're all still in majority of us in a um, remote working environment, and some countries back in the office for sure, but there's still that need for collaboration. So we want to make our solutions a lot easier to be able to work across teams um, in a distributed environment. And that's in the area of designing of APIs, in the area of testing, if that's from a functional perspective or performance and even security, and then also running your tests at scale. So if we have multiple um, QA teams or multiple dev teams that want to go ahead and kick off tests and you want to keep traceability and tracking against those tests, um, that's where that kind of you know release phase comes in there with Test Engine. And then also from an operation perspective, um, it's your synthetic monitoring that comes into play there as well, making sure that for these particular business critical um, applications that we're monitoring them outside of just one location. We're monitoring them across the world. So with the parallel uh, development and testing piece also fits into collaboration. So Swagger Hub, just to introduce, is a um, API collaboration platform built on top of the open API specification, um, formerly known as Swagger. And this allows us to go ahead and basically design a, an API from a RESTful perspective um, and also build out documentation, but also plugging into a number of different ecosystems in terms of my API management, API gateways, building out mocks, um, generating SDKs and server stubs, but then also being able to go ahead and take that definition that we have from an open API perspective and then go ahead and build out our functional testing from you know, large tests and regression suites to very small unit tests to integration testing. And then following that, build out virtual services where we can go ahead and take that definition that's based off an API that's not actually fully built, but we have designed it um, like a blueprint of a house, and we can go ahead and build out logic in there from a virtual API. We can then share this with our testers, we can share this with our front-end developers, so that we're actually focusing on this parallel development and testing perspective. One side of the house is focusing on deployment, one side of the house is focusing on release and uh, testing from all within side of Swagger Hub as well. So how important is collaboration? Um, so we ran a um, 
a poll based on our state of uh, SmartBridge state of API report um, in 2020. And one of the questions that was asked um, to you know many people who um, answered in terms of the API world um, was how important is collaboration? So 76% of organizations that surveyed um, merited that there it is their highest level of importance. Um, another question that was asked here is what is the main way um, what is the main way changes and feedback is communicated to other teams? You can see here about 27, 28% uh, uh, of the 2020 responses are using Jira Confluence, 25% um, using Slack, emails down quite a lot when we talk about year over year, and then also the likes of internal meetings as well. So it's definitely gotten to a stage where, um, I mean, we really need real-time information. We need real-time collaboration. And it's an extremely important business um, priority um, for particular organizations that we see. And that's kind of what we're going to focus on today in terms of the, the workshop. Yeah, absolutely. So Swagger Hub and Ready API um, will be bringing through that actual flow. So you'll see it on screen in terms of, first of all, what Swagger Hub is. It's a collaboration platform for RESTful API design. Allows you to go ahead and design and document your RESTful APIs. This allows us to go ahead and then plug the particular definition and import it to Ready API, which is a platform built for um, API readiness. So this allows us to build out virtual services, build out functional test suites, build out security test suites, and then also your um, performance testing as well. Um, so there's a number of different um, items that we'll discuss. And then AlertSite is essentially our platform that allows us to take either our definition or our Ready API project and build monitors that we can go ahead and I suppose monitor synthetically across 100 locations across the world, 24, 24 by seven in terms of availability, uptime, and functional correctness. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into the platform. And again, please just let me know if you can still see my screen. Just let me know if you can see um, my hub and Swagger Hub in the left-hand corner. Um, from what I can see on the other screen, it looks good. So this is the main page of Swagger Hub and our, um, and our hub. So what we can see here is a catalog in terms of some APIs that are inside of my organization. Now, my organization could be a a team, it could be a company, it could be a location of an office. Um, so we can see all of that information over here. And we can also see particular projects uh, listed underneath here as well on the left-hand side. Now, what we'll do in this example is we'll work on an example of creating a, a library, and then we'll go ahead and talk about how we can collaborate, how we can plug into different ecosystem tools. We're gonna take that particular API, we're gonna import it to Ready API, we're gonna build out some testing, we're gonna build out some virtual APIs, and then we're gonna go ahead and push this to alert site for monitoring as well. So you'll be able to see how the whole flow works. And we do have documentation that will support everything, but hopefully um, this will bring you through exactly um, what I just mentioned at the start. So we'll create a new API. We're just selecting create a new API from here. We'll just select a, black, a blank canvas. And we'll just give it a name of API Days Workshop Singapore, give it a version of 0 0.1, and just give it a name of API Days and a description of Books Library. I'm going to sit this in my organization, which is SmartBear APAC. So this is all of the um, APIs that I manage here locally. Um, we can choose to add this to a project if we like. So I have different projects from here as well. This means that I can have specific access to specific members and then visibility, private or public. So this means that if I set it to private, only the people inside of my organization can actually access the API. Now, one thing that I've also switched on is my auto mocking. So auto mocking is essentially allowing us to build a static mock to go ahead and validate that the responses are correct. And this sits actually in behind the platform, but we're gonna talk a small bit more about dynamic mocking um, in a bit more detail. So if we go ahead and create an API, and I'm going to go ahead and on my other screen, just paste a bit of a JSON once this has been created. And once this has been created, I'm going to paste that JSON in. And then we'll go ahead and um, build out our API. So you can see here I have my version, um, my API days. And then in my path, just going to move that down a small bit. We'll go ahead and build out our flow. I'm just going to clean this up a small bit because we have a bit of duplication. So up to here. Let 
we should be clean. Yeah, so no errors. So basically what this API is doing is it's searching for books, uh, searching for authors, and searching for subjects as well. So we have all of our YAML uh, built in here in terms of our spec. We also have what we call um, domains that are reusable assets. So I can go ahead and reference these throughout the actual um, API. So if we jump into one of these as an example, this brings me to a reference object of a um, maybe a response of a 404, maybe a model schema. This means that instead of having to write all of this YAML, I can just go ahead and reference it inside of my actual API, as you can see from here. So pretty straightforward in terms of the actual API from a design perspective, if you've ever worked with um, Swagger or OpenAPI, um, we'll see that we have our searches from our documentation, which I can go ahead and try out, pass through a parameter such as Game of Thrones. And then when I execute, this will allow me to interact with our auto mock, which is a vert server that sits in behind the actual platform. So this allows me to go ahead and validate that the responses give me the 200, but also go ahead and give me my um, response um, in JSON as well. We can see our 200, we can see our 404. So <clears throat> this is essentially how we can go ahead and use any, any of the templates. I haven't used a template in this example, I've just built out a blank canvas. But the next phase is around versioning, collaboration. So it's fine doing this on our own and we can go ahead and you know edit it continu uh, continuously. And that's what you had to do do traditionally from a from an open API perspective, um, if you've used any of the open source tools in the in the past, but really it comes down to working across teams, not only from your development side, but you may have BAs involved in the, um, I suppose, discovery and definition um, of understanding what this API is going to going to do, and then also. You may have testers who want to understand. Okay, what are they going to test in terms of the definition? So we can go ahead here and create new versions. So I can go ahead and add a new version, give it a name, 0.2, and then we can set that as a default version if required. And then I can see the differences between our version 0.1 and 0.2 by just selecting on our compare versions. And again, version control and version management is always something that uh, can be, you know. Uh, Quite, quite interesting and quite different. So you can see here our version 0 0.1 is pretty much blank because we've gone ahead and pasted um, a new version essentially from here. And you can see this will highlight any of the changes that have been made. And if I wanted to go ahead and select on this, we can com compare and merge and merge that from here as well. So it's just a really nice way to go ahead and understand where the changes have been made from version to version. Um, and again, obviously we can save that continuously as well. Now, when we talk about working with integrations and in a different ecosystem or a set of ecosystem tools, we can go to our integrations. We see that our API auto mocking has been enabled. And if we go to add new integrations, I can choose from a list in terms of you know, API gateways, um, Apogee Edge, if I'm working with Azure DevOps services, but if I'm also working with the likes of GitHub, and again, this is going back to that collaboration pieces, understanding the actual definition from a, a JSON perspective or from a YAML perspective, being able to generate client SDKs and server stubs and be able to sit these in a repository that may feed into a CI CD process, as an example, um, or if we want testers to pull down the actual code from there as well. So I can go ahead and point to the likes of GitHub to do a sync. I can then paste um, my test name here. I can connect to GitHub using single sign on, and this will generate my token. It'll choose my repo. I can choose a Swagger Hub integration. And then I can choose the methods that I want to sync. So a basic sync will create us a branch called Swagger Hub. A advanced sync will allow us to go ahead and uh, use our own branch in that case as well that um, allows us to make any changes to that branch. Now, in terms of what we want to generate code-wise, we can generate JSON in terms of our definition, JSON in terms of um, the definition as well as YAML. And then if we're working with servers like Node, um, Python Flask, um, yeah, all of these are there listed. And then also client SDKs. So if we're working with the likes of C Sharp, Java, Python, etc., you can go ahead and generate the code um, and then have that synced to your repo as well. So once this has gone ahead and configured, you can create, execute, uh, create and execute, and then this will go ahead and push directly to the repo. Um, if you do want to pull to the repo, that is also uh, from the repo back to, Swag to Swagger Hub, that's also available to do as well. Now, 
that's one area of kind of collaboration. The other is inside of the actual Swagger Hub platform. So if we go over here to the share and collaborate button, we can invite team members to collaborate in terms of this API. We can invite users uh, based on their username, if they're already signed up to the platform, as well as their email. And we can invite teams that we may have structured as well. So if I just type in API, you can see here, I have teams that I've already defined inside of the platform for the likes of API architects, API consumers, API documentation. And I can go ahead and give them access rights to edit, to comment, or to view in terms of the particular um, API. So let's go ahead and just jump out of that for a moment. Now we're seeing our editor view in terms of our spec, our documentation. If we want to just go ahead and view our documentation fully, we can just view the documentation. This will bring us to a new window, which will just show the actual um, documentation itself. And we can go ahead and customize any of the header information. This will also show us our version in this case as well. You may want to go ahead and add in some um, security authentication. Uh, this is all referenced in terms of the open API documentation that you can find on swagger.io. And all of that is available from there. And in terms of code generation, we can export uh, client SDKs, server stubs um, directly from the platform as well. So you can go ahead and download this um, as well as the actual definition and then point that to your relevant IDE. Okay, so let's just make sure that that's saved. We'll jump back into the platform here for a moment, and we'll jump into our Swagger Hub tool. And then we'll just talk a small bit about um, collaboration from the actual platform itself. So if we go to our settings of our organization, this is where I can look at my members give them particular access in terms of what we call a consumer, which is someone who can essentially access the API documentation and explore in a, essentially a read-only role, and then a designer who can create, edit, and collaborate, so really actually get their hands dirty um, working on the API. And then an owner is essentially someone who's like a power user for that organization. So you can see here all of the different roles um, in terms of who's a consumer, who's a designer. You can remove, you can uh, change people from there as well. Now you might have seen teams that I've structured in one of the previous screens. I can go ahead and add in um, different team members from here, API architects, API consumers, et cetera. And then when we select on one of these, we can see each individual role who is a designer, who is an owner, and I can add people to the team in that case as well. Now, one thing that we also focus on in terms of this collaboration platform is, I suppose, governance and making sure that there is standardization in place in terms of API design. We all know that everyone, in terms of people who are designing APIs, have their own way of doing it. But if we're talking about consistency um, in terms of API designing, we may want to go ahead and add in some particular style validations or style guideline rules to make sure that we have that consistency. So we have the ability to use some out of the box um, style validation rules, such as API info, operations, such as summary should start with an uppercase and end with a dot, and then also models. So all model properties must have examples, et cetera. Now we can also create custom rules. So if we're just saying that we, we're working on an API and we're working on multiple APIs, and maybe we want to make sure that there's consistency that every API is using OpenAPI 3.0 or 3.1. We can go ahead and make a rule for that. Um, we can also make a rule to say, okay, we're only using camel case, or we're only using underscore in terms of the way that we're writing the API. And this can all be done using the likes of regular expressions by just specifying our path in terms of our spec, and then also providing the regex and then creating a validation. And then we can go ahead and import the API from here, try it out, make sure that it's valid. So really with Swagger Hub, we're focusing on um, consistency in design with style validation and standardization. We're focusing on collaboration, making sure that, okay, we're working on an API design from a design first perspective. We may want to involve multiple different um, people in that process. And then also um, being able to focus on working with different ecosystems as well. So working with the likes of API management and API gateways, working with the likes of um, source control systems, working with the likes of um, um, API management solutions as well, but also being able to have a single source of truth to work on your API design and documentation from here as well. Okay, so we're gonna take this particular API that we've just gone ahead and created. We're gonna jump into a ready API. 
and this is Ready API. So this is built for API readiness, and it complements um, Swagger Hub because you'll see in a moment what we're going to go ahead and create. So I can create my functional testing, load testing. Um, I can create virtual services, and this supports not only SOAP requests, it also supports REST, GraphQL, and now also async and Kafka, uh, Kafka um, and also the likes of MQTT, Java Messaging Server, et cetera. So many, many different protocols from here as well. So this is built on top of what you already may know of as SOAP UI. I'm sure many people have heard of it over the years. So we've built this um, particular platform uh, called Ready API that allows us to create more detailed um, functional testing, load testing, and security testing, as well as creating your virtual services all underneath one platform. So if we go ahead and create a new project from here, I can go ahead and import a definition. I can create a definition, or I can go ahead and discover an API. If we select import definition, I can determine automatically what that particular definition may be, if it's REST, if it's SOAP, GraphQL, or async. But I also have a tab here that calls Swagger Hub. So let's jump back and make sure that we have the name of our API correct. So it was called um, API Days. Um, and we'll go ahead and jump back in here and search for that. And you can see here that this will bring me up into API days. So I have a couple of them. Um, let's go ahead and select this one, which is the latest. And we'll go ahead and select the version 0 0.1, I believe. Let's just make sure. OK, let's select 0 0.2. This is the one that we want just to make sure that we actually have data. So that is what it's good. It allows us to point which version that we want, because <clears throat> when we're talking about from a, a QA or a tester perspective, there may be different versions of the API. We need to understand, OK, what's the default version? Um, what do we need to test against? So we'll take 0 0.2. We'll go ahead then and import the definition. <clears throat> we'll bring this directly into a ready API. So this brings us in our definition. You'll see it over here on the right, left-hand side. This shows us all of our different resource paths, um, all of our different methods. And you'll be able to see um, underneath here, we have our endpoint, which is vertserver.swaggerhub.com. And then the actual specification is listed from here as well. So really clear and concise to show us all of our different paths um, across all of our different um, structure of our API from here, as well as our endpoint. So from here, we can go ahead and do a number of things. We can choose to set um, authentication, authorization, and security. We can go ahead and describe the APIs. So if we need to make changes to the endpoint, if we need to make changes to the methods that we're using, changing from some, something from a get to a post, a post to a push, et cetera. And then we're going to streamline building out this particular flow into functional testing, security testing, performance testing, and then virtual APIs. Now, if we look at the first one here as books, we have a get and we have a request. This provides us a endpoint, and this provides us a particular requ request parameter. This could also be a payload as well. So if you are doing a post, this will allow us to go ahead and build in a payload response, a payload request, and we can go ahead then and um, build that into our workflow. So what we're going to go ahead and build is a virtual API off this particular definition. So we can do that by right-clicking and going to actually generate a virtual service. We do have the option to generate a test suite from here as well. But if I generate the virtual service, this says, OK, where do you want to go ahead and sit this virtual service? Let's go ahead and choose to sit it on my local host port 8085 for the moment. This will bring us into our virtualization piece of the puzzle. So I'm just going to make a couple of these windows smaller so we can see everything. OK, so let's see what we have on screen. I'm just going to use a pointer tool just to make sure that everything is clear. So we have our incoming request. We have our responses. And we can add in multiple different responses from here. And we can choose how these responses are defined. So am I using uh, some Groovy scripting to determine when these responses will be outputted? Am I going to use some um, you know, X path or JSON path to make sure it's dispatched at the right time? Or am I going to use a parameter view, which is what we'll work on today? So let's take a look at one of the responses that has come across from the definition. Again, this definition is built off what we have already defined inside of the Swagger Hub tool. So this gives us our, um, our JSON. Now, 
inside of Swagger Hub, this was pretty much hard coded as part of the um, static virtual response. From here, it's actually allowing us to edit it. We can change it. We can do really whatever we want because it's a virtual API. We can change our status code from a 200 to you know, 400, 404, 500, et cetera. Um, and then we can go ahead and change headers. We can add in data sources and much, much more. So let's go ahead and make some changes to this particular guy. I do like Game of Thrones, but there is also some other books that are uh, really good as well. And I want to go ahead and run some queries against this virtual API from here as well. So we have two responses. And let's just focus on this books example for the moment. The second response is going to actually give us a 404. And we're going to say, and just in terms of editing the YAML or the JSON, we're going to say, um, Type and then just book not available. Okay, and from the response one, we're going to make some changes to here. So we're just going to remove Game of Thrones and first name last name, and then also publish date. OK, so you might wonder why I'm doing this. We're going to make this into a dynamic um, response. OK, from what we saw in Swagger Hub, again, it does a great job of it, but it's really limited to what we have defined inside of the spec. So if we have a response, We've defined it to say, OK, this is always going to return Game of Thrones. But if I'm a tester, if I'm a front end developer, I may want to see different outputs. But we might not always have access to that particular production API or that uh, API that's sitting in a QA environment. So what we can do in this case is build out a virtual API. We can deploy it, and we can share it with our teams. And they can go ahead and test out so many different uh, scenarios. And again, we're still in that design phase when we're talking about open API. We haven't actually built a full API in this case. We're building out in a parallel um, perspective, and this allows us to focus on continued collaboration. So we're going to choose a data source. I'm going to point to a data source one, and I'm going to point to an Excel sheet. But I'm going to create some properties first. And the first property is going to be called book. And then we're going to have a first name. If I can spell, we're going to have a last name. I think the last one that we had was a published date. Actually, we're going to add in one more called description. It was the one I forgot. So let's go ahead and add in a description and just keep everything consistent. And we'll just move this up. So we have book, description, first name, last name, and then we'll also have a published date. And let's have a look at that Excel file. So I have the Excel file down here. We have our titles. We have our descriptions. We have our first name. We have our last name. And we have our date. And believe me, um, 1813, it took me a while. Pride and Prejudice, I mean, it's a very good book. You should definitely check it out, uh, one of my favorites. Uh, but we also just picked out some of the other ones from here as well. Um, if you have any comments in terms of anything around these books or other books that I should have added in, uh, leave a message in the chat or a Q&A box as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this data. We're going to publish this into our virtual API, meaning that if I have, in this case, it's just random data, but if I have a real life scenario working with you know, a financial institute and I have you know, thousands of records of uh, customer details and I want to populate that into a particular um, virtual API from a database or from a Excel file or from any of the other um, areas that we support, you can do that from here as well. So let's select from our Excel file, point to my desktop and point to books. And we're not going to do that for the moment. We're going to go ahead and select sheet one. I think it's sheet one. And then we're going to start at cell two. And then this is where essentially our, um, our virtual API is going to take this data. So let's just confirm a couple of things. We have um, our books. We have uh, starting at cell two, which is our Harry Potter. And we have all of our other relevant information. So let's go ahead and point to our data source down here at the bottom. We'll implement 
the actual mocked response. So we'll just right click in between our inverted commas. We'll point to what we call get data. We'll go to, I think this one was book. Then we'll go to description. And we'll go ahead and point to description for first name. We have our first name. And for last name, we have our last name. Okay, I'm just gonna make sure that everything is correct there. Just wanna make sure that the spelling is right. Title. Let's just, yeah, let's, add it. let's just give it a go. And then that's fine. And then we'll go to point to publish date and from here as well. Okay, so we're gonna pull this data in uh, from the name. We may need to change a couple of things in terms of just the actual output, but I'll, I'll take a look at that in a sec. And then if we go to our local host port 885 and just turn this on, and our response that we had was called um, this guy. Just copy him over. And then we're gonna go ahead and right click here and then generate a test suite. This will create us a test suite and test cases for our APIs. And you can see here, I have books. And we're just gonna change our response to um, localhost port 885. Now, one thing that we didn't add in was a parameter to say, okay, when do I go ahead and spin out this data? So I'm gonna go ahead and add in what we call a dis dispatch parameter to say, okay, when are we gonna go ahead and get this response? And when are we not gonna go ahead and get this response? So what we can do in that case is add in a parameter and we'll add in a default response, which will be always the negative. And then I'm gonna go ahead and create a new rule to say, if the parameter of title is equal to available, then send the response for response one. And we'll also add another rule to say, if the parameter of title is equal to not available, then send the response to response two. Okay, so let's go ahead and just type in from here and then go ahead and send out a response. Okay, so it did work. So we just uh, wasn't sure what the name and convention there, just you know how it goes with demos. So um, what this will give us is the available books. Let me bring this over a small bit more. So we can see Harry Potter was returned. Let's see if we have any other values. We have the Great Gatsby. We have um, the date that it was published. We have the first name and the last name. And then we also have Lord of the Rings, and of course, Pride and Prejudice. So when we say not available, let's see what happens. We get book not available. Now we can see this in this outline view. We can also see it in the JSON view as well as we have defined what's actually happening. And let's select available again. This gives us the validation here that the response is accurate. And the outline allows us also to create validations or assertions to validate, okay, we know that we're getting a published date, so let's create an assertion for existence that the published date is actually existent. This builds us out a JSON path expression. And then from a description perspective, we also have a description. I can go ahead and create this for existence as well. Now, if we wanted to create a more complex assertion, we can do this with scripting, supporting Groovy. We can use regular expressions, and we can also validate the content. So we can build out, again, a JSON path expression and then our expected result in this case as well. Okay, so that's building out our um, function, our, our virtual API and then our functional tests and I suppose describing the behavior of it as well. Now we can change different behaviors in terms of the virtual API, such as server capacity, um, connection bandwidth, and then start sending error codes at a certain point in time. So I can go ahead and really slow down this API um, and I can go ahead and really make, make it really fast. So I can go ahead and just change the latency to be, you know, 20, 20 milliseconds and um, congestion to be 5%. And then we can change the minimum threads, maximum threads and response delay. And if I go ahead and start sending requests from here, it may work, may work in terms of more of a, 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 a defined environment where I've actually need to test something that's not running on my my local machine as such. And that's the next point I'll talk to you about is actually deploying this virtual service. Because if I'm a 
a testing team who wants to collaborate and work together or a front-end developer team, I'm not really going to get too much success working on my my colleague's local host because it's going to be hard to connect to it. So that allows us to go ahead and deploy a virtual API to what we call vert server. So you'll see vert server um, populating here with all of our virtual services. Now vert server is a lightweight tool that runs on my machine. And it allows me to go ahead and say, okay, let's take this virtual service and let's deploy it to an IP address. Um, and you can see here, my IP address is 10.0.0.14 port 9090. And then I can go ahead and start running um, some tests against that from here as well. So if we actually just touch on this guy, we'll stop you. And then we'll take my IP address, copy that over. And we'll just change the responses. Let's go ahead and add in a new endpoint. And then this will allow us to go ahead and start interacting with the API as well. So it'll just take a, a couple of moments to define. Um, I probably just need to configure it a small bit more. Yeah, so it's just going to send some responses. Let's just see, make sure that that's the right one. Ah, wrong one. Let's go ahead and use this guy. API Days virtual service, it's sitting on a different um, port. And then this will go ahead and then should start sending us requests or responses. I just need to configure that a bit more. But if we go back to the virtual service that we have already defined, we can just do it um, either side. So this just probably needs, needs a small bit more configuration from my side. But we can go ahead and deploy the virtual service um, from our local host to that particular IP address. Now. I've talked a small bit about functional testing, but also the ability to create security tests or load tests from Ready API. So I can right click on my functional test. I can create a security test from here as well. This is based on the top 10 OWASP vulnerabilities, um, as you can see here, which is an industry standard for um, API security testing. So I can actually scan my API tests using these out of the box um, scans, and I can also create a custom scan. Uh, as well. So what's applicable uh, and most applicable to you in this case as well. Now, I also have the ability to select on my test suites and my test cases to right click and create a load test. Now, we all know that <clears throat> load testing is something that comes up quite often, um, can be quite seasonal in terms of, okay, you know, at a very busy period from an e-commerce perspective, or, you know, if there's a new release or a new product being released, we can go ahead and create a load test built specifically in this tool as well. So <clears throat> this will create us a load test for our test suites or our test cases. I can then go ahead and use some templates and different load profiles to go ahead and create my uh, load tests inside of here as well. So when we're talking about API readiness, we're really covering not only functional testing, but security testing, as well as that, we also have our, our load testing from here as well. Um, now, we talked a small bit about um, different integrations, like pointing uh, to source control in the previous session. The Ready API platform also allows us to go ahead and you know enable collaboration, meaning that I can take my project, and then I can go ahead and point this to the likes of Git, or Azure DevOps. This builds us out into a composite project, which makes it into smaller pieces of XML rather than one big XML file, meaning that it allows multiple people to work. And especially in a remote working space, being able to sync your projects from a testing perspective um, to something like Git or GitHub um, allows us to go ahead and choose this automatically, can point to my Git repo, and then select and um, do my pull, my my commits, my pulls, and my pushes um, directly inside of the tool from here as well. OK, so that's from a, a Ready API perspective. And what we've just, just to summarize what we've covered here is importing a definition. Again, we're still in that design phase, building a virtual service, making changes to that virtual service in terms of configuration, uh, importing different data sets um, to make it more dynamic, changing behaviors, and then being able to run a functional test uh, against that, making sure that the response is valid across different sets of data, and then being able to create functional tests, security tests, and load tests all underneath one platform. Now, the third phase, going back to my slides for a moment, was um, around this piece here, the operation and monitoring. <clears throat> 
So what does that mean? It means that I can go ahead and take an existing project uh, or take a definition and then go ahead and build out some API monitors for this as well. So let's just jump into the other piece of the tool here. And we have alert site UXM. So this is built for synthetic API monitoring as well as web. But this allows us to go ahead and create monitors for uptime, availability, and functional correctness. And you can see here we have some views of some of the monitors that we use internally at SmartBear and some of the other um, APIs that we're monitoring here. In terms of the general endpoint, the definition are also um, API projects from Ready API. So this allows us to go ahead and create a monitor by manual creation in terms of the endpoint, using open API as a definition, or uploading and monitoring our ready API project from here as well. Now, it's going to ask us for a .zip file. So the way we can do that inside of ready API is take our project, and we can go ahead and select export. Where do we want to export it to? Our desktop. And just give it a name. And then inside of the platform of alert site, we can go ahead and upload our monitor and choose our measurement plan and then choose our file from our local machine. Just take a second. Machine just froze. Let me just see. Okay, my machine just froze there for some reason. Let me just go ahead and I think I have a bit too much running on Chrome right now. So let's just kill this guy. Okay. Anyway, we'll jump into that in a bit more detail um, in a couple of minutes um, when that fixes itself. I think it's just when I tried to open that particular file, um, things just stopped this one bit, but let's just see. Okay, so just to summarize in terms of the um, actual project itself, we have the project that we've just in, got ahead and imported. We've built out some um, functional testing from here as well. Now, one thing inside of the test cases, I did talk at the start about our support for different protocols. If I right click here and add a step, I can choose different protocols such as SOAP, um, REST, um, GraphQL, and then also event-driven. Are focusing on async as well. And then if I wanted to go ahead and add in different data sources from a data-driven testing perspective, I have the ability to do that uh, from here as well. Now, this is all from a kind of a project level, but if I wanted to go ahead and build out some dashboards, I can build out dashboards to see my test suite status, my test case status, and then any running virtual APIs that I may have. So all of this um, can be seen here on the screen, and then also different integrations that we may have as well. So if we're working with other definitions, maybe you're not working with OpenAPI, maybe you're working with RAML or API Blueprint, you can see all of the different integrations that are supported from here. <clears throat> and then I suppose a lot of what I've done is inside of the tool, but we're really focusing here on automation as well, making sure that, OK, if we have functional testing, we have security testing, or if we have uh, performance testing, that we can do this in an automated fashion. So I can actually right click here on my project and I can launch the test runner. So test runner essentially allows us to say, okay, I want to execute all of my test suites, my test cases, um, and I want to go ahead and execute maybe individual ones from here as well. So I can choose the type of reporting, if that's going to be JUnit, and then I can also have additional report types to say I have JUnit, um, PDF, um, Excel, or CSV. And then another kind of collaboration um, focus, again, that's really a lot of the topic today, is we can actually have a Slack channel um, to have updates um, after each test run that is run. So we'll just say if you have pipelines or if you have builds, um, you can actually use the test runner, the command line, to go ahead and uh, point directly to Slack, making sure that you have a channel there that's ready for any API result updates as well. So it's a, a pretty cool uh, functionality that is available. So the command line, again, looks like something like this, just calls a .bat file based on specific environment information and environment variables, variables that you provide. And then this allows you to go ahead and execute your test. 
Okay, so I know we have about five minutes. I am going to leave the last five minutes for questions. Unfortunately, my other screen has frozen through, but um, I'm just going to leave the next five or so minutes for any questions um, that you may have. Um, and if there's anything else that you're kind of unsure of, of what we've shown, or if there's anything that you'd like us to go through or explain in a bit more detail um, in terms of, okay, you know, what's, what's a Swagger Hub? perspective how is it different from um, general swagger um, or from a ready API perspective um, you know what does this mean in terms of virtual API what's the difference between a virtual API and a mock so yeah so um, swagger editor free I mean that I think that question was there yeah swagger editor free version will it work on only cloud um, it'll, it'll work on both I mean it's it's um, it's the ability to have on a, uh, a cloud or on a, a local machine, um, whereas that, that's from a Swagger editor open source. Uh, from the Swagger hub that we are just talking about today as well, um, that's available through a, um, a cloud. And can have, so if you wanted to have this inside of your own environment, um, so any of the Swagger offerings are available in both scenarios. I think it comes down to a lot is, the need for collaboration and uh, the need for, um, I suppose, having a single source of truth for not only managing the actual editing of the definition and using the editor, but comprising of all of the solutions um, from a Swagger Hub perspective or from a Swagger perspective together. So that could be code generation, that could be um, cataloging, uh, that could be um, that could be cataloging, that could be also integrations, um, that could be also managing different projects as well from there. Um, yeah, I mean, going back to that question, it's something that we can definitely follow up on. I think there there is a lot of documentation out there for uh, examples of that working with the local machine. So, yeah. Yeah, so the recording will be uh, provided from API days, so um, everything that we're covering today is recorded. I know there's quite a lot of information from it, but I hope it kind of makes sense that we're focusing really across these three key areas. So let me just share my screen again. So the key areas that we're focusing on here um, include the, from the, I'm just bringing up my other screen. So include the API development lifecycle from create ideate, create, release, and operate. And we're essentially positioning our solutions from here as well. So finally, my machine started working. <laughs> so I'll jump back to that in just a second. Um, so here we can see our API development lifecycle. We're focusing on the design first part here, the creation of tests and virtual APIs, the scalability of your API testing, if you have many, many people working together and you have a number of tests that are being sent, if you're working with CI, CD and pipelines that you really want to scale up your testing and have a singular place or a singular server to be able to view all of the metrics. And then also from an alert site perspective, being able to monitor your APIs from here as well. And that's just the last thing I'll show just because my machine is back um, working, thankfully, um, is that we can upload a zip file here and then create a monitor and then we can see some of the monitor views um, from here as well so this will show us information such as our response time our availability any steps that we have um, and then we can see reports we can be alerted based on um, email um, it also supports uh, VoIP um, if you got a phone if you wanted to get a phone call and we also work with the likes of pages UD and Splunk, uh, Splunk in this place as well so really we're focusing on the design the test and validation and then also the operations perspective uh, based on what I um, covered today so if you want to get some reference material um, you can come to our booth um, and we'll have that there available for you. We can also reach out to you individually um, and we'll share that information with you. Happy to walk through a more detailed session if there's something that you want to understand further across any of the, I suppose, areas that I uh, touched on today or that I presented today. Great. So I hope the session was of value to everyone today and thanks for everyone who attended. Um, if you want to chat to us more um, in the next break, just pop over to the virtual um, Smart Bear booth. Happy to have a more detailed discussion or share maybe a, a demo um, of a piece of something um, with you guys. So we're going to be at the booth um, just after this session in the next minute.
So just at the time, uh, so thanks very much for attending the session today, guys. I hope you all enjoy the rest of the event. I hope you all had a great event so far. And I'm looking forward to speaking to you all again. And definitely pop over to the booth. Thank you.